Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another Indie Game Friday, where each week I take a look at a different independent computer role-playing game. This week I'm taking a look at a sort of retro-inspired, turn-based RPG I meant to cover last year. Designed and published by Silver Lemur Games, Legends of Amberlin was released back in August of 2019. Legends of Amberlin is a first-person, turn-based, grid-movement, party-based RPG inspired by old classics from the 90s, especially the middling-era Might and Magic games. It has retro-inspired graphics, but as of a few months before this review, the sprites have been updated to be slightly less low resolution, so if you've seen the game before and are wondering at the change, keep that in mind. In terms of plot, you are a party of adventurers who has been summoned to meet with the royal wizard via a letter. After journeying there, you are told that the wizard has discovered an ancient crown, which everybody has forgotten about due to a magical spell, which of course explains the full title of the game, Legends of Amberland, The Forgotten Crown. You are then sent forth to investigate this crown and how to recover it. When you start a new game, you are given a choice of four difficulty levels. Easy, Normal, Hard, and Insane. These adjust monster damage and hit points, experience required to level, as well as prices in town. You then create your party. The party consists of seven characters, and the way they are organized impacts not only their chance of being attacked, but also their order in combat. The character in the middle is the most likely to be attacked, with characters further towards each end having increasingly lower chances of being targeted. You can also quick create characters if you want that will generate you an entire party. Combat, turn order, starts at the middle position, then alternates from each side towards the outer ends of the party, so keep that in mind when you're selecting what classes go where. Furthermore, enemies do get a turn between certain characters in that order, and I'll go into that in more detail below, so it can be helpful to position your healer characters in such a way that they have a chance to go before a potential later enemy turn, even if that may put them in a slightly more attackable position. For each character, you first select a race and a gender. Races include human, half-elf, elf, and dwarf. Each race has its own strengths and weaknesses, clearly indicated on the screen. Once you've selected a race, you then select a sub-race. These sub-races give additional modifiers, offering slightly more customization. These modifiers may actually include additional stat gains on certain levels, which can add up over the course of the game. Next, you pick a class. Each character can pick one of eight classes, although some classes are actually specific to different races. The core classes are the Knight, a heavily armored fighter type, the Warrior, who focuses on damage, the Ranger, who includes a touch of magic to go with their fighting, the Bard that includes slightly more magic, the Wizard who concentrates on damaging spells, and then the Healer who concentrates on healing spells. Each character also gets two class choices that are specific to that race selection. These are usually slight variations on existing classes. Each individual class also has a special ability that they can use once a day. This is usually class appropriate, such as an attack that hits every monster in a group, or an instant recovery of some hit points for the entire party. After selecting the class, you can then name your character, select a portrait, and then distribute five attribute points among your five basic attributes. There's Strength that gives damage bonuses and contributes to maximum encumbrance, which I will again get to later. Toughness, which increases your hit points. Dexterity, which gives you a bonus to hit and evade attacks. Knowledge, which boosts the arcane stat, which again I'll get to in a bit. And gives additional effects based on the character's talent, which is class-based. Finally, there's Willpower, which increases magic points and reduces the magic damage caused to them by spellcasters, although not creatures' natural magic. After you've created your characters, you are given a brief rundown of the wizard summons that start the game, and then you're dropped into the world near the starting town. The world is represented by a first-person view with a compass that shows heading in the top. In the upper right-hand side, you do get a mini-map as well as the world coordinates you're in, so getting lost is has absolutely no excuse. Beneath this are shortcuts to access other screens. On the bottom of the screen, there is a status indicator that tells the exact time as well as how many crystals and gold pieces that you've found. Gold pieces are used in shops and services in towns, while crystals are used to purchase rare magic items in town. Under this are your character statistics. The last bit of interface are the direction keys to the lower right, which can be used to navigate the world by mouse if you prefer. Outside of combat, you may access an overall map of the area you're in, the character status screen, the spell book of any particular character, as well as info on the area that you're in. There's also the ability to wait a turn to allow monsters to move, set options and save the game, and then the rest option, which can heal you. 
On the character screen, you can see that your character's stats are in more in depth. There's the name, the class, and the race, of course, as well as what hit points and magic points they have and what their maximum is. Then there's their level, experience, and then the experience needed for the next level, as well as any status effects they may have. Under this is the position of the party that they occupy, and this can be adjusted. Beneath this are your five basic attributes, then your derived statistics, damage for your attack, hit rate, evade rate, and armor, which reduces the physical damage you take. After this are your elemental resistances. These may be gained either by race or class, or through equipping items. There are just four elemental resistances, fire, cold, lightning, and acid, and each one reduces the damage you take from that type. Then there's immunities. Each of these immunities may also be granted by a class or race, or more likely from equipment that you find. There's poison, confusion, paralysis, fear, mesmerize, and petrify, which are all actually binary status effects, meaning that you're either under them or not, and likewise you're either immune to them or not. The final entry of the class screen are your talents and specials. Not every character has a special, but they work similarly to talents, giving you a general bonus. Talents give characters special effects. For instance, knights and other warrior classes get tactics, which improve critical hit chance based on your knowledge stat. Casters can get Arcane Mastery, which increases Arcane by the knowledge stat, etc. Arcane is a stat that doesn't appear on the stat screen, but can be seen in the magic menu instead, and it just affects overall spell effectiveness. The next tab in the character screen is Inventory, where you can see the party inventory and what you have equipped. Each character can equip a helm, armor, a weapon, a shield, and up to three accessories, although certain classes in fact, one certain class loses both the shield slot and one accessory. Your character's encumbrance is also shown here. Most items that you equip have a weight, and you want to keep that weight lower or equal to your overall encumbrance rating. Each item may include an appropriate stat mod, attribute mod, as well as resistances, immunities, and other effects. Weapons generally have a damage bonus rather than a damage range. Your damage range is based on your strength modified by your weapon's damage bonus. Armor has an armor bonus, which are just added up to represent your character's damage reduction. Aside from immunities and resistances, other effects are available in the game as well. For instance, the Elven Blade tagged weapons automatically hit goblins, ogres, and trolls. The last two tabs in the character screen allow you to review your current and completed quests, and then see what titles and accolades that you've earned through your actions in the game. Around the map, there are a number of places that you can go. Castles and dungeons are treated as their own separate areas. Small huts and tents simply present a text box that may pertain to a particular exchange or quest, while towns have their own submenus. Each town is about the same and offers the town's name up top, a quick button to replenish food at the bottom, as well as access to their various services. The Elven Healer allows you to return characters from various status effects. The Town Hall allows you to speak to the Mayor for quest purposes. The Inn allows you to rest, to buy food, store items, and then to talk to various NPCs in the area, which may provide clues to problems in the game. At the Trainer, you pay to level up when you've got enough experience, since you don't automatically do that in the field. You may acquire enough experience to level up several times, so sometimes you can have like three or four levels in the queue. The gold cost for this is largely minuscule early in the game. At certain levels, you may also gain an additional point to spend in an attribute, and you can also reset your attributes to reallocate all of your accrued points. Leveling a character up also heals them, increases their hit points and mana, and may give spellcasters access to new spells at certain levels. The shop allows you to purchase basic gear as well as to sell excess gear. All town shops sell the same menu of items, and as you progress in the game, you can uncover craftsmen that increase the quality of items that you can buy at any town. Finally, there's the magic shop that allows the purchase of magic gear for crystals instead of gold. Entering castles and dungeons are much the same, with the main difference being the number of hostile enemies. Both offer a first-person view of the world, with dungeons having doors and gates separating areas from one another. Doors are easy enough to pass through, just move into them. Likewise, stairs can just be moved into to move you to a different map. Gates, on the other hand, require you to hit a switch to open them. Hitting a switch, reading a sign, or opening a chest may all be done simply by moving into them. If there's an NPC behind a door, it may simply open a text box rather than put you into a new area instead. As far as enemies go, whether you're on the overworld or in the dungeon, you see them on the map before you encounter them, and they may move around as you do, taking their turns as you do. In order to fight them, you simply move up to their square. 
At this point, you enter combat mode. Enemies can come in groups of up to three in a square, although of course large numbers of enemies may span several tiles. These are generally treated as entirely separate combats though. Once combat mode is engaged, you get your enemy's sprites up right up in front of you with their info bar over their heads. The menu system on the right changes so that you have your character options available. There is a basic use last attack slash cast last spell option up top. Then beneath that there's your basic attack, your spell book for casting a particular spell, the ability to wait if attacking is a bad idea, monsters that show information on the monster that you have targeted, beneath this is your character's special class ability that can be used once per rest, and then the flea button. Play proceeds as I mentioned above, with each character taking an action from the middle on out to the end, starting at slot number 4, then going back and forth to 3, 5, 2, 6, 1, and then 7. Enemies may get attacks in certain slots depending on their inherent speed, although this is not guaranteed. They get a chance to attack before character 4, and then depending on their speed, after character 5, then after character 6. Generally, they may get to attack on up to two of those three slots, speed dependent. Finally, once you've completed combat, you gain experience and gold. If you need to rest, you can do so if no enemies are near. There's actually two options for resting, quick and full. Each requires either meat or fruit rations. Quick rest requires fruit rations and takes a shorter amount of time, only healing up half of all your character's hit points. While a full rest requires meat rations, takes twice as long, and not only heals your hit points and magic points up to full, but it can also restore the weakened and confused statuses. You can only carry so much in terms of rations, I believe at the beginning you get three of each. And so the game goes on. You basically wander the overworld, picking up leads and quests from towns and castles, fight whole hordes of enemies, level up, manage stats and gear, etc. It is very reminiscent of the early Might and Magic series, where the world opens up in stages, allowing you to go wherever you wish to and approach quests and side quests as you uncover them. Like that series, you start out fairly slow and then you ramp up substantially over time, and as a result of the open-ended nature of the various quests, your experience in terms of the overall story can vary. There are some differences from that series, of course. In terms of simpler stat layouts and the lack of ability to do ranged attacks before combat even starts, as well as the lack of certain skills that make general movement over the map a little bit easier in some points. At least, those that you start with. The itemization is a little bit different as well, with the majority of the limitation on, what you, on who can equip what boiling down to the encumbrance system. You'll probably be doing a little bit of shuffling from time to time to make sure the appropriate bonuses and resistances are spread over the party without too much in the way of duplication. Graphically, Legends of Amberland is very retro, but it's done in a nice way. It looks like a classic 90s era game in terms of the sprites and overworld objects, but with a slightly sleeker interface, which is good. The UI does look like it can be suitable for touch screens, which may or may not be a good thing depending on your view. The sprites in first person view graphics are colorful and varied, however. I understand that they used to be more pixelated, but the newer 64 pixel sprites are actually quite nice and do a lot towards making the game easier on the eyes. The music, uh, it's not too great. It is reminiscent of something that you'd hear in 90s games, and for that I give it accolades, but while it isn't too intrusive, I did find that it wore on me after a while. It's one of those soundtracks where I'd maybe not turn it off, but I'd probably turn it down to like 10 or 20 percent. It's nice for ambience, but that's about it. The sound effects are a bit harsh, but appropriate to the genre, sounding very much like you'd imagine the clashes, activations, spells, and other feedback games from the game of the 90s to sound like on a modern system. I personally do like the presentation, despite what I've just said, but I can see where if you aren't a fan of retro RPGs, it could become a little bit annoying. The writing's not bad. It's about on par with genre standards from the time, perhaps a little bit simpler in terms of story. All the clues, quests, and other snippets are given via text boxes when you uncover the appropriate NPC, sign, or letter, and so with those limitations in mind, it is understandable. Overall, the real draw of Legends of Amberland is the gameplay loop, and I found that to be very solid, for what it is. It may not be the longest such game, but for those who enjoyed the first-person step-based games of the 90s and want something a little bit different from the real-time Eye of the Beholder slash Dungeon Master style clones, then this one will definitely be worth taking a look at. And I find that amusing since both of those series are mentioned as inspirations for this game, but I'd say that The Legends of Amberland definitely cleaves more towards the turn-based family of first-person RPGs instead. Further, the slight difference between the various classes and the various difficulty levels may add a little bit of replayability if you're looking for that. 
Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up here. This has been the RPG Crawler with my uh, indie game Friday, A Legends of Amberland. I'll leave a link below to where you can check it out. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content, both tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye. And if you're still watching this far, I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have supported this channel via Patreon or direct donations throughout the years, without which this channel could not have lasted as long as it has. For those who are feeling particularly generous, you can still support my work through Patreon and now through Subscribestar as well, through the links in the description below.